So before I read today's text, it's not often that Veterans Day actually falls on a Sunday. We always mention it, but uh, it is a unique day in history, 11-11, and we're getting close to that 11 o'clock hour when that armistice a long time ago took place. Let me ask our veterans in the room if you would uh, mind standing where you are. Any veterans? We thank you for your service, even as Anne has already prayed in the prayer, for those who are serving right now, uh, maintaining, guarding, protecting, aiding here and around the world. Our text is from the Gospel of Mark. This is the 12th chapter, beginning at the 38th verse. It's the Gospel passage, lectionary passage for the day. Listen, it's Jesus speaking. As Jesus taught, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces, to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Holy God, break open this word for us that we might grow in faithfulness, in service to you and the world to which you send us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So a little boy was standing in the church hallway looking up at the large wooden plaque there on the wall in that hallway with a, a hundred or so brass nameplates on it, little names engraved on it. And and the pastor was coming down the hallway and, and seeing him coming, the little boy caught his attention and asked the pastor what all of those little names were on, on the plaque there. And the pastor quietly said, well, son, those, those are all the men and women from this church that have died in the service. And the little boy cringed a little and, and got very quiet. And, and finally, with a bit of uncertainty, asked, was that the 830 service <laughs> or the 945? It's been years since I told that one, but it still, <laughs> it's still, it still works. I, years ago, I served in the First Presbyterian Church, Roanoke, Virginia, and they had plaques. They had big, huge wooden plaques, gold letters of the names of those who served World War I, World War II in the hallway. But the living membership of that congregation happened to have a significant contingent of VMI grads. And for those of you who don't know, that's Virginia Military Institute. That's what those initials stand for. And a gentleman in the congregation, World War II veteran VMI grad, who was a good friend, actually the guy who taught me to fly fish, and I'm indebted to him for that, caught me one day after he'd just returned from a trip back to VMI for alumni weekend. And he told me the story. He says, I was, I was seated in the crowd and and being the school that it was, they always, at every crowd event, alumni, you know, events always included a traditional parade of the cadets across the field, right by the stands where the, the alums and all the distinguished guests and friends and family were, were seated. And my friend said he was seated right there just close to the front, and as the parading cadets approached the stands, there's one lone cadet walking along right by the front row just ahead of the colors, the, the flag, whispering instructions to those in the stands. And he came up to the first few gentlemen in the row and he says, it's customary to rise when the colors pass. Well, if these had been visitors from outer space, that might have made sense. Those directions could have been appropriate, but he picked two, of course, alums from VMI. One of the men said, Cadet, you have one dress parade a week. We had five a week when I was a student here. And Oh, by the way, have you, have you met? And he motions the man next to him sitting in the seats. He says, can I introduce you to Major General Anderson? <laughs> My friend said the cadet immediately straightened up and he tucked in his tunic and he angled his cap a little, clicked his heels, he saluted, dropped his hands, you know, sharply to his side, all within about a nanosecond. And my friend said it actually looked more like he was having 
a seizure than it was <laughs> military precision. He was so caught off guard. But even the lowly cadet, their first alumni parade in uniform, wants to impress. And you and I know what that's like. We all like to impress others. So here's this description of Jesus, of, of scribes, teachers of the law, if you will, and how they love to be known for who they are, the position they hold, their standing, their respect, their authority, their power, success, you name it, that's the kind of stuff they like, Jesus says. They love to prance about in their long robes with their fringe and their tassels. I always get nervous when I preach this text because, uh, you know, long robes and the people would bow and scrape before them in public places. I look back, the last time I preached this text, I was in the midst of, of ordering a new robe. Of, it was paid for by a gift this congregation gave me on my 10-year anniversary of serving here, 30 years of ministry. And I mentioned that I discovered as I was reading through the catalog that the suggestion for extra, extra braided trim of color to go along the velvet panels for that, that distinctive touch, adding height and dignity to your pulpit robe. And I, I was tempted, but <laughs> beware of these, Jesus says, who always take the best seats in synagogue, in worship. Of course, in Presbyterian circles, the best seats are back in the back. And, I know it really messed with people. They have two of the back pews roped off today. Like, really? Like... <laughs> but these are the ones who, who chose the best seats in the community celebrations, the, the ones who got the best seats in the hottest restaurant in town because they were known and wanted to be known, and people who knew them wanted to know that they were known by the ones who wanted to be known. And these were the individuals people invited to their parties, sort of as special ornaments at the dinner table, which I always wondered about how your digestion went at such a meal, because every time a scribe passed by, you were supposed to rise respectfully. Beware of these, Jesus says. Beware of, of those who, who love to be greed, greeted in public, and, and actually James Moffat in his translation says saluted in the marketplace. Your holiness, doctore, O most esteemed one, the Reverend Donald Lincoln, how they love the best seats, the best parking spaces. But it's funny, I, you know, having preached this, I had forgotten until I looked at my biblical research again that there is, of all things, a, a scribal, we're talking about scribes, a scribal nuance in this text. And you, you may or may not. Recall, I think I mentioned it before, that in the New Testament, the manuscripts have no punctuation in them. Translators get to pick and choose where they put the commas and where they put the periods. In our translation, and it's in your pew Bible, and the one I read, there's a comma right after Jesus' words, beware of the scribes. Beware of the scribes, comma, who like to be greeted, to, who have the best seats, who wear the long robes, and blah, 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 blah. As opposed to beware of the scribes, no comma, which means beware of the scribes who preen and are self-absorbed. Beware of the ones who act like that. Insinuation in that translation will be not all of them do, but some. Beware of them, the, one, the ones who think they're better than anyone else. And that's a huge difference in translation. Of course, truth be told, my guess is if you're anything like me, you know, we all like to know some of those folks, at least some of the time. I mean, they're the ones that invite you to their corporate box at Lincoln Financial, like, you know. <laughs> That's, I mean, most of us, at least sometime in our life, wish we were, we were one of them. I don't know about you, but I look longingly at those guys in the dark suits by the baggage claim in, in the airport holding a sign or an iPad and and I keep looking at her to see if there's, if, there's, if there's a sign that, you know, like this, just, hold, just 
imagining for a moment I don't have to get on the shuttle and go to my car, that somebody's going to take me to a limo and drive me home. I like, you know, I keep looking. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He says, beware those who cheat widows out of their homes. I mean, this, this is not just puffed up tassel wearing. I mean, this is serious business. These are those who not only have positions of power and, and love to show that off in public, but these are those who have positions of power and they lord it over others. These are people who use their power to abuse others, like Dan is talking about, people who, who deal with those who are in need, who are in crisis, and enslave them in human trafficking. These who use their power and their position to take advantage of other people who say long-winded prayers in the synagogue and then in the next breath keep the temple tax so high that the poor widow on her fixed income has to give virtually all she has in order to stay right with the religious authorities and tradition because of those who interpret the law this way. Beware, Jesus says. And if you didn't catch it, John already alluded to it in his children's message. The very next thing, if I've read it in scripture, what happens after this? Beware of these scribes. What happens is this story of the widow's might. That's the old language. This widow who puts the coin in the treasury, the last coin. And how many times have I preached on that all about the generosity of this this widow in the marketplace and you know it's you know it's stewardship sunday i can you ask for a better text to preach i mean the presbyterian women the the least coin offering it's all about this generosity well you know following on the heels of jesus words about devouring widows houses i wonder if actually jesus is lamenting this widow putting in her last coin for the fact that some scribes were so concerned with keeping their fancy robes and their place and their power that they would demand of this widow her very last penny so, of course, she could remain right with God. Is that godly? Beware of them, Jesus says. What's clear is that Jesus condemns those in place and power who have, who have no clue or no care about servant leadership. Those who don't understand his way, that the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And so it is to be with those who follow in his way. A couple weeks ago, I was asked to give an inspirational talk to a group of Army generals at the Army Navy Club in Washington, D.C. I faced that opportunity with more fear and trepidation than just about anything I've done in recent history. I mean, one, two, and three-star generals are just not in my wheelhouse. So I asked a couple military officers in this congregation for some thoughts, and one of them said to me, remind the generals what a difference it makes when a general officer shows up for the 6 a.m. morning run with the troops and the NCOs. Remind the general what a difference it makes when they stop and chat with the private in the mess hall, just informally. People notice. The troops respond to that officer differently. Another one said, encourage the generals to be willing to show some emotion, great joy and even laughter when something wonderful is going on, deep sadness, even tears when tragedy has struck. The troops troops need to know that they're human. And if they do, they will follow them anywhere. Servant leadership. 
It's about those who are in position and power who know it is to serve as opposed to being served. I mean, let's, let's face it, somebody, somebody has to be in power, somebody has to be in charge, somebody has to be elected last Tuesday to do the work of the people. And thankfully, there are people, gifted individuals, gifted to lead. But the call always is to serve the people, to serve the greater good. Beware of those who do that only to get the best seats, who, who want to use their station to their own advantage, rather than for the benefit of the other. Beware of those who devour widows. Yesterday we, we celebrated the life of Sue Mills. A deacon, a Stephen minister, confirmation class credo leader in this congregation who at age 53 died of a brain aneurysm. And it was just a couple months ago, Pastor Ann mentioned to me she was writing a letter of reference for Sue, and I asked what for, and she said, well, it's for a tenure-track position at Widener. You know, Sue has a PhD in nursing. I said, really? I had no clue. I, no, never heard anybody call her Dr. Mills. And Sue never insisted on that. Sue chose some of the most servant-oriented roles in the life of this congregation. Servant leadership. In the last couple of weeks, we've seen a, a couple prominent instances of servant leadership. Dr. Jerry Rabinowitz, a compassionate physician who died while trying to help some fellow members of the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh on some, you know, sort of fancy, self-important doctor, but a physician of boundless compassion. I heard his friends, his family, his neighbors, his patients tell this Penn grad who died doing, they said, what he always did, helping others. And Sergeant Ron Halis, who is set to retire next year from the Ventura County Sheriff's Office, whose, whose last act in his 29 years of hard-working, dedicated law enforcement position for the Sheriff's Office, his last act would be to give his life an attempt to stop the shooter at the Borderline Bar and Grill in Thousand Oaks. Here to serve. It's why I wrote in, in the news and events a, a, a column about the vision team um, today who did the reveal all through the month of October and most of the time in the congregational meetings and other things, they, you know, they were out doing stuff and the tables and, you know, not in here. And not one of them says, Donna, is anybody going to thank us for the thousands of hours we put in this, this past year? Not a one of them. And, and, and they're, some of them are going to continue the work, but a lot of them are handing that off to the next group of people they're not looking for awards, vision teams. Anybody, I see Bert here. Stand up, any vision team members? I saw Christy over here earlier. Anybody? Yeah, Gary. This is what I love about being a pastor in this congregation. It's filled with people who get it. Who do what they do because it's what Jesus did for us and what he calls us to do for others, not to use place and power to lord it over others, but actually to share the love and grace of the Lord with them and with anybody and everybody we meet. Place power, position, election, all given so that folks can be servants of the greater good. And on this Veterans Day, what a great reminder for us of what our veterans do. 
and a great reminder of us who follow Jesus that the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. May it be so for all of us who follow him. Amen.